two ten-year-old schoolgirls, Holly Wells and Jessica Chapman, went missing in the small Cambridgeshire village. It was the biggest police investigation the country had ever had. Oh, God is forgiven, just come home. Hi, guys. Welcome back. I think it's safe to say that all of us have been in school, perhaps with the tiny exception of those who have been homeschooled for the whole duration of their childhood. School can be an unpleasant place at times. There's always a nasty kid, a bully, or a menacing teacher to ruin a perfectly fine day. But most of all, school is a safe place, right? It's there that you make your first friends and meet your first adults outside of your family that teach you really important values. A school's teachers and caretakers are the people you can go to with any problems. Sometimes they can even help you with your family issues, things you can't discuss with your parents, or problems you're too embarrassed to bring up at home. But in some cases, it's precisely the adults at school who pose the greatest danger. A kind of danger so hidden and so dark that no one suspects. In August 2002, best friends Holly Marie Wells and Jessica Amy Chapman disappeared without a trace and triggered the biggest manhunt the United Kingdom had ever known. But the truth was a very dark one, and it was about to shake the whole country. Had everyone been living a lie? Watch on, but prepare for a truly upsetting case. This is the story of two girls who loved each other more than anything in the world. Jessica Amy Chapman was born on September 1st, 1991, and Holly Marie Wells was born on October 4th that same year. They both grew up in Soham, Cambridgeshire in the UK. They met each other very early on, and it was an instant match. They were besties from day one. They studied together, did their homework together, and supported Manchester United together. Needless to say, their families were pretty similar, which explains why they were already so like-minded when they became friends. So the girls would spend a fair amount of time at each other's place. It was a picture-perfect story for two smart 10-year-olds with big hopes and dreams. In August 2002, the girls were getting ready for their 11th birthday, but things were about to get very dark. On August 4th, just before noon, Jessica left her home, heading for a family barbecue at Holly's place. She was quite excited. She told her parents she was going to give Holly a present she'd gotten her from their last holiday in Menorca. It was a necklace engraved with the letter H. She went to Holly's place and so did Natalie, a friend from the same school. The girls played video games and listened to music. Natalie left, so Holly and Jessica decided to do their favorite dress up, Manchester United t-shirts. So Jessica put on Holly's brother's t-shirt and Holly's mom, Nicola, took a picture of the two friends. It was the perfect afternoon. After the picture, the girls had dinner with the Wells family. Then they went back to Holly's bedroom. But around 6.15 p.m., they got an idea. They were going to sneak out of the house and get sweets from a vending machine at a local sports center. And so they did. But minutes later, they vanished. When Nicola entered Holly's room at 8 p.m., she realized the girls were missing. They weren't answering their phones either. In fact, their phones had been turned off. Their two families went into full panic mode. They knew Holly and Jessica wouldn't disappear without letting their parents know. Something terrible had happened. By the next morning, the whole country knew about it. We all woke up on that Monday morning to a story that was already starting to gather momentum. And by the time I came in to do my program, it was already the biggest story of the day, 24 hours after the two girls had gone missing. It was one of those long, hot summer days when there perhaps wasn't a lot of other news around, but it seemed to catch the imagination. Everybody was drawn to this story. It wasn't just the media that was notified of the missing girls. Of course, the Cambridgeshire police was the first to know when Holly's mom alerted them on the evening of August 4th. But no matter how many people the police assigned to the case, there were zero clues pointing to the girl's location. Four days into the search, the police decided to make the local school their headquarters. They would involve everyone in the Soham community in their case until the two girls would be found. Things like this simply didn't happen in Soham. 
they weren't going to happen now either, the police thought. At the time, the sheer scale of it was um, really unheard of. It was the biggest police investigation the country had ever had. It was one of the smallest police forces which was engaged in that investigation, but they were collating material that was coming in from around the world. There were 400 police officers working full-time on the case, going house to house and asking for any relevant sightings and clues. Hundreds of volunteers joined the search too, and a few days later, the US Air Force sent personnel to nearby air bases. During these days, the police gathered all the information they could get on the girls' last evening together. What had they done after sneaking out of the house? We knew that the girls had set off from their home from a family barbecue, popped over the road to a tuck shop to get some sweets, and then they talked to the caretaker Ian Huntley, who'd said that after he'd said cheerio, they'd walked on up here Clay Lane and probably ended up here in Red Lion Square. Indeed, it turns out that the last person who had seen the girls was the caretaker from their school, Ian Huntley. He was a 28-year-old friendly man who lived with his girlfriend, Maxine, not far away from Holly Wells. But Huntley was happy to help the police with their investigation and described every detail of that evening. He said hi to the girls and saw them as they walked out. It seemed fine, very cheerful, happy, chatty. There was nothing suspicious about him. However, days turned to weeks, and the police were getting nowhere near finding the girls. Desperate and in need of support, the Soham police asked for the help of Detective Martin Underhill, who had famously solved a child abduction case. I can remember when I met the senior investigating officer, his face was just an absolute picture of um, shock, horror. And I actually said to him, are you okay? And he went, no, I, I'm just so swamped by this. You know, what, what do I do? Imagine being a police officer in a small town and dealing with petty thefts and car vandalism for 15 years. Suddenly, two 10-year-old girls are missing and their families are in shambles. It's a huge amount of pressure. Detective Underhill pointed out the biggest issue in this investigation. The officers had missed the golden hour that first hour after a child is reported missing. That is the time to gather all the clues and find them before it is too late. The officers had missed that whole evening, and by now, way too many days had passed. There's no point in blaming individuals if they've not been properly trained and given the, the background and understand the enormity of the, the issues. But they couldn't give up. Now, all they could do was narrow down the suspect pool. First, the police looked at the girls' families. Sadly, in one third of abduction cases, family are involved. But in Holly and Jessica's case, their parents were quickly cleared of any suspicion. One thing that became very clear very quickly is that the families, the Chapman and Wells families, were not involved. You then realize that unless a terrible accident's happened, that somebody else, a third party, has been involved in the disappearance, abduction, or possibly of this, these children. With the girls' families ruled out, the police started to turn their eye toward anyone who had been in contact with Jessica and Holly over the last few days. The police officers spoke to everyone at the girls' school, and there was one figure that seemed to be the most willing to help, the school caretaker, Ian Huntley. Huntley had spoken to the girls on the night of their disappearance. And there was another catch. His girlfriend, Maxine, was the girl's favorite teaching assistant. So why not help the police? How do we know they were here at 6.15? Well, we have an eyewitness. Ian Huntley here is a familiar figure. Evening, Ian. You're the school caretaker. The girls, Jessica and Holly, would know you. And they saw you on the front doorstep. What, what went on? The girl, I don't know the girls. Um, I stood on the front doorstep grooming my dog down. She'd run away and come back a bit of a mess. Um, they just came across and asked how Miss Carr was, as she used to teach them at St Andrews. Anchorman Jeremy Thompson had a strange feeling about Huntley, but many people are oddballs, he thought. There are very few people who have murderer written across their forehead, but, uh, you know, there was something slightly odd about it, but it seemed a plausible explanation that he gave. Apart from appearing like a bit of an outsider, there was nothing wrong with Huntley as far as people watching him on the news saw. But he had a long history of talking to cops. Sadly, 
offenders do like talking to cameras. It's been shown several times, and, and Huntley was no exception. He enjoyed doing that. Um, he got a kick out of doing that. Um, and it was a piece of history being made. Ian Huntley might have been a young man, but he already had a very dark past. Before moving to Soham, Ian and Maxine lived in Scunthorpe, Yorkshire for about a year and a half. Their neighbor, Marissa, thought Ian was a quiet man with a secretive life at first. I was neighbors of Ian Huntley and Maxine Carr for about 18 months before they moved to Soham. He just stayed, he just stayed in his own house. His, his job was work, come home, maybe go to the shops, come home. And that was it. They didn't go anywhere for a young couple, Ian and Maxine, didn't even go to the local pub. The police kept coming to Huntley's house, so naturally, Marissa asked him what was going on. Surprisingly, Ian started confiding in her. He told her there were some allegations that he had violated some girls, at least two, he said. But he was adamant he hadn't done it, and the girls were just out to get him. This is why he said they had to move home. Marissa was already getting strange feelings about Ian Huntley. Then, something truly weird happened. I finished a 12 hour night shift. It was, it was in the winter at six o'clock in the morning. I pulled up out here on my push bike and he was underneath my stairs and he made me scared. And he asked me if I got two slices of bread and butter for him. That's the first time I really felt scared of Ian Huntley. And it got worse and worse. Soon, Marissa noticed Huntley was physically hurting Maxine. Marissa would hear Huntley curse his girlfriend and tell her she is there to serve him. One day, Marissa even dragged Maxine into her flat and tried to convince her to dump Ian. However, there was something keeping her in the horrible relationship. Before Marissa could change Maxine's mind, Huntley made them move again. Ian changed his last name to Nixon and tried to make a fresh start. But on Christmas Day 2000, local garage owner John McLeod saw something that shook him to the core. When John climbed up the stairs to Maxine's aid, Ian let her drop on the ground and John so bad, Ian himself fell down. Then to John's shock, Maxine started telling him off for hurting her boyfriend. And I was in such a state of shock about that, I thought, you know, maybe these two deserve each other. Ian Huntley had assaulted an 11-year-old girl back in 1997 and done several other things that were never caught. On top of that, he had been harming his girlfriend for years and years. By 2002, he was feeling invincible. If he had never been reprimanded for his actions, why would he stop there? In 2001, Ian Nixon changed his name back to Huntley. He and Maxine were going to move home again. This time, his motivation was to be closer to his father. So they packed their bags and went to sew him. Murderers are masters of deceit, public deceit and self-deceit. They are great self-deniers. So you can look at them in the eye and they've already persuaded themselves that they didn't do it. It was Maxine that first got a job at St. Andrew's School as a teaching assistant. Quickly, Ian followed and got a job as a caretaker. But how come nobody checked his record? After all, he'd had multiple run-ins with the police in the last five years. Those records have been deleted. When you're dealing with someone involved in offenses against young women, one, one of the things you have to watch for is a developing pattern of behavior. And that's why it's important to keep intelligence about someone like Huntley. Unfortunately, when the head teacher hired him, they couldn't see a thing about his past. It was a small police mistake that cost two girls their lives. And the police mistakes didn't end there. Usually in an abduction or murder investigation, police start at a small place like the victim's family home and then they work their way outwards. But remember how I said they'd put their headquarters inside the school? Well, that's where Ian Huntley worked. And that's where they would make a gruesome discovery. But for some reason, it took them two weeks and 400 officers to do so. As the investigation progressed, the police turned their eyes to another school regular, Maxine Carr. Uh, this is something I'll probably keep for the rest of my life, I think. Um, it's what Holly gave me on the last day of term. She was very, very upset because I didn't get my job. And that's the kind of girl she was. She was just lovely, really lovely. Did you notice Maxine's grave error? Jeremy didn't. 
one of his producers pointed out that Maxine was talking about Holly in the past tense. Who does that? Unless they know she's dead. She may well have been giving something away. Uh, she may well have done it you know, without, without any consciousness. Uh, but whatever it is, she clearly knew what had taken place to some degree and that those girls had visited the address. Luckily for the desperate police, this short media interview provided a good enough clue to pursue the suspects. In the last few minutes, a 28-year-old man and a 25-year-old woman, both from the Soham area, have been spoken to by police officers and have agreed to give witness statements to us. Soon enough, the police found bits of Holly and Jessica's clothes burned in the school storage. Ian and Maxine were arrested on suspicion of murder. When 13, 14 days have passed, you know those children are alive. And so before the bodies were found, I think everyone in the police force anyway knew these children weren't coming home. If the police knew that the worst was true, the public, not to say the girls' families, were still hoping for the best. It's not like there were too many possible happy scenarios. It's just that nobody wanted to believe what had actually happened to Holly and Jessica. Unfortunately, on August 17, 2002, the dark truth would be revealed. Just after noon, a 48-year-old gamekeeper named Keith stumbled upon the girls' bodies lying neatly side by side in an irrigation ditch next to a lake in Suffolk. Keith hadn't seen them, he'd just noticed an awful smell about two days before, and the smell wasn't going away. That day, he knew he had to investigate, but he would regret doing it. He urged his girlfriend to stay in the car, and he phoned the police immediately. Detectives arrived within minutes with a large forensics team, but there was a problem. That whole month had been incredibly warm and humid. The bodies were decomposed beyond recognition. The approach then was, uh to try and identify by some means uh, who the bodies were, because although there were two apparently small skeletonized bodies there, clearly it was important to determine it was actually uh, Holly and Jessica. The crucial pieces of evidence were the girls' jewelry. It was quickly identified as Holly and Jessica's. Now the tragic news could be shared with the grieving families. You might say, phew, terrible news, but at least they got the killers. Well, it wasn't that easy, not at all. Ian and Maxine might have been under arrest, but they weren't talking, and the police couldn't prove they had committed the murder. All they had was suspicious behavior and Maxine speaking about Holly in the past tense. It was clear they knew something, and it was clear Ian was guilty one way or another. How do you prove this in court? The prosecution had to build the whole trail. The girls' evening on August 4th, step by step, and Huntley's last few weeks. 20 different scientific teams were called to assist in this case. The prosecution wanted to make sure that no piece of evidence gets ignored and that everything is used to get the dark truth of August 4th. The first big step was to determine the girls' cause of death. It's, it's one of those cases where it, it simply wasn't possible to determine a cause of death, so the cause of death for both of them uh, was unascertained. Because the bodies were basically skeletons when they were found, it was impossible to see any injuries to the skin or muscle. And since there was no skeletal injury, blunt force trauma was ruled out. The conclusion was that, almost certainly, the girls had been well, The pathology is, was awful, and um, for the families to hear about the discovery of their children and what was involved must have been horrendous for them and remain so, I'm sure. The girls' parents now had to live with the fact that they will never know for certain how their daughters spent their last moments alive. But now the forensic team was starting to realize what had happened after their deaths. First, Huntley tried to burn them. The charred part of the skeletons was the first piece of evidence that would clearly link Ian Huntley to the murders. And the fact that a, a place that he had access to had the burnt clothing attributable to the girls, I think with one of his head hairs on top of it, so in terms of sequence, quite important, uh, turned out to be rather damning evidence of itself. Next, the forensic team found chalk deposits on Ian's car. Immediately, this was matched to the chalk on the drive 
that led to the irrigation ditch and the bodies. When the detectives presented this evidence to Huntley, he confessed. Now, the police had to figure out just how involved Maxine had been. During the trial, Maxine pointed at Huntley and said, Let me go! It seemed like she was finally ready to speak up against her horrible boyfriend. Finally, she was free from his grasp as she knew he would be locked away for good. But was she telling the truth? After all, she had lied to the police for weeks on end. The prosecution still didn't have a clear picture of what had happened at Huntley's home that fateful evening. So his defense team came up with Huntley's own version of events. The defense scenario was that the, the girls turned up at Huntley's door with one of them complaining of a nosebleed. They had then gone up to the bathroom to deal with the nosebleed. And this is when I think uh, credibility was stretched. Somehow one of the girls had fallen into a bath of water and drowned. Uh, the other girl had screamed and been smothered in midair and then collapsed dead on the spot. Not a lot of this story made sense. Why would a 10 year old accidentally drown in a bathtub? she would have had several seconds to pull herself up. Also, it was nearly impossible for the two girls to die at the same time. The, the first may not have been something he set out to achieve in itself. The, the second, unquestionably. Um, that's the awful nature of what happened because um, the, the second one would have known the fate of the first already. Finally, on December 17th, 2003, the jury had a verdict. Justice Moses, the trial judge, has made it. And I'm hearing that Ian Huntley has been found guilty of count one, the murder of Jessica Chapman. Ian Huntley has been found guilty of the murder of Jessica Chapman and the murder of Holly Wells, again by a majority verdict, I am told, of 11 to one. Ian Huntley was given two life sentences in prison with the possibility for parole in 40 years. Maxine Carr was sentenced to 42 months for obstructing justice. She had been away for the weekend with her family when the horrifying event had happened, but she knew what had happened and she had concealed the truth for two weeks. Maxine was released on probation in May 2004. The case was over and Huntley was in prison for at least four decades. But the girls' families were nowhere near satisfied with this. The system had failed them. How come Huntley didn't have a clear police record when the school had hired him? How could he get away with harming children in the past and be free to do it again? I asked uh, Michael Bishard now, Lord Bishard, to take a look at this so that we could get a proper uh, examination of how we could learn the lessons and how we could proceed for the future to stop such an incident ever happening again. We owed it to Holly and Jessica's families. This was when it became clear that there was a big fault with the electronic intelligence system in the UK at the time. What I was very surprised at almost immediately was to find out that we didn't have any routine electronic way of exchanging intelligence information between police forces, the 43 police forces in the, in the UK. And that did shock me because I thought with IT even 10 years ago. Holly and Jessica's case became the main incentive for developing the police national database. Now the police can quickly check someone's record no matter where they came from in the country. In 2002, this could have prevented Ian Huntley from getting a job around children. Of course, the national database triggered a negative reaction from people who felt it went against their freedom. People are famously worried about the government knowing too much about them. Well, I'm sorry, if it takes 10 minutes to fill out a form, but it means a child is safe, then those 10 minutes are worth doing. And anybody who can stand there and say, I shouldn't be checked, I'll ask you a question, why? Some people in the government want the responsibility to fall on the employer's shoulders, such as the schools. Others say small institutions don't have the power to learn enough about dangerous individuals. This conflict is slowing down the progress of the database. However, as of 2022, the UK police is much better prepared in dealing with people like Huntley. SOAM had to happen. It needed something like SOAM to make us realise and kickstart us into dealing with that loophole where a travelling was uh, escaping notice and was going under the radar. 
uh, hopefully most children in this country now are safer and are protected. Ian Huntley committed a heinous crime, and he paid for it repeatedly in prison. Serial killer Mark Hobson tried to kill Huntley by scalding him with water, and in 2010, another prisoner s**ed his throat. Recently, Huntley released an official apology for taking the girls' lives. I am so terribly, terribly sorry for what I have done. The people of Soham took me into their community. They trusted me. They gave me a job and a home. I am sorry for the pain that I have caused. I can't change anything. I cannot remove that day from history what I have done. I know those girls would be 26 this year with families of their own, jobs, and lives. I thought about them when they were turning 21 and when they were turning 18. Indeed, perhaps the saddest part of cases like this is that you always think, what would the children have grown up to be? What dreams would they have followed? Would they have had children of their own? It's incredibly tragic to cut a young life short, and there is no excuse for that. While Ian Huntley will forever be forced to relive his worst mistake, Jessica and Holly's families will have to live with this horrific tragedy every single day for the rest of their lives. Hey, thanks for watching. Don't forget to give this video a quick thumbs up and subscribe to my channel for more. Till next time, and as always, stay safe.